Hi, everyone. Yeah, thank you for coming to this session. OK. Yeah, my name is Bo, so I'm coming from Apple. And uh, I have been working in the big data area for about, five, about more than 10 years, so it's a long time. And now I'm in Apple building data platform and the machine learning platform. Yeah, very nice to see you here. So my colleague. Uh, hi, uh, bonjour. Uh, my name is Hai. I also from Apple, and I work in the data infra team. Uh, so I'm glad to be here talking about uh, uh, reliability and cost efficiency uh, for running Spark uh, using Kubernetes in the cloud. Thank you. Well, great, let's get started. So this is a talk about cloud native data processing and also about Apache Spark. So I want to do a very quick survey. So here, how many people use Spark before? Oh, great, <laughs> okay. You are in the right place and I'm in the right place, okay. <laughs> nice. Here is a quick agenda. We will maybe very quickly introduce Spark and how fault tolerance works in Spark. Then we will present what kind of problem we try to solve. Let's tell some problem with Spark. And uh, there are already many solutions. They are built for different reasons. So you will see a lot of. And we built another solution. Uh, now we call Cloud Shuffle Manager, like CSM. And we will explain how it works, what benefit it has. Then hopefully, yeah, we can have more discussion. So please, uh, if you have any questions, so we can dis discuss more. Yeah. Yeah, very quick about Spark. Spark was created about uh, 15 years ago. It's a long time. And it is a unified framework to do data processing on a very large scale. It's very fast. How it works, it, it is underlying its MapReduce, very simple concept brought by Google. If you have a very large amount of data, it splits the data in small chunks and process those chunks in parallel. So you can use your compute power to process them in massive scale and run it very quickly. And originally, Spark was running in your own data center, like a yarn. And these days, people bring Spark to cloud area. It can run on Kubernetes. Cool. Yeah, very small kind of explaining about how MapReduce works. Uh, MapReduce proves the data in two stages. The first stage is map. It split data and uh, put related data together on each machine. Here we call executor. Here is a SQL statement, select word and count. It do uh, word counting, very simple uh, SQL execution. So the, the map side gets the data split. Then it will shuffle the data and uh, get the same word to the same place. Then in the reducer side, it just counts each word and it generates the output file, which counts how many words appeared. On the line, Spark is just very simple like this. Even though it's simple, Spark brings multiple stages might reduce into the framework. And between different stages, it can shuffle data. When it shuffles data, it will exchange the data files among different executors. So we will see some problem might happen here. And before I will work, how Spark solved the fault tolerance problem. So because this different stage, so if one stage goes wrong, then Spark will try to recompute the data from previous stage and then continue running. That is how Spark solved for tolerance in current, uh, stay, uh, current status. So for example, here, there's an executor three when it dies, and the executor five, which depends on executor three. So what will happen? Spark will launch a new executor, like executor six here. This executor will reprocess data. And now, the next stage, execute five is happy. It can get data from there and continue running. So now what problem we have? 
So let's think in this scenario. So normally you have a lot of data, and uh, the executor may, may be there across multiple stages. In this case, the executor one cross stage 10 and 11. So it has shuffle file, shuffle data on these two stages. Now let's see if executor one dies, uh, the next stage, executor five, got fetch failure. So what will happen? So Spark will launch another executor on the middle stage. Then that middle stage will read data from previous stage. But in the previous stage, because that executor still is dead, so the middle stage will fail again. And uh, Spark will launch a new executor in previous stage. So it will kind of prop propagate back and to the previous stage and uh, just a chain reaction. Uh, the result is it may run slow because a lot of retry. Or in the end, uh, there's a limit of the retry. So the application may fail if the retry has happened too many times. This is really a trouble in the cloud. So people like to use Spot VM because Spot VM is kind of cheap and uh, can save you cost. But the downside is it can be terminated by cloud vendor at any time. So if it's terminated, your Spark job will high likely fail because all the shuffle data lost. And Spark has a dynamic allocation feature. Uh, it will also kill your executor, so it may cause your application fail as well. So how we solve this problem? In the cloud area, the idea is very simple. We can decouple compute and the storage. Here the storage is shuffle storage. So we don't store the shuffle data on the local disk. We can store the shuffle data on remote storage. So in this case, when your executor is gone, the data is still in the remote storage. So your execution can resume at any time. And this is very powerful. That means when you run Spark application, you can just kill your executor at any time without impact the success of the application. The downside is right now, the remote storage, like cloud storage, it may be slow when you read a lot of files. So it is good at throughput, but it's not good at latency. So if you have many small files, it will be pretty slow. You will have some ways to solve this problem as well. Yeah, before our solution, the industry already worked on this for a few years. They come out all these solutions. So you can just uh, search it. You can find a lot of information from that. And uh, before I worked in Apple, I was in Uber. There I built my previous shuffle service, the remote shuffle service there. Uh, we launched another dedicated server to store the shuffle data there. But now here in Apple, I kind of built another version. So because we want to make the serverless, we do not want to maintain another server. So we will see how we do it later, yeah. Yeah, here's a quick overview and uh, explain what's the difference of different solutions. So we look at at three angles. So whether it supports remote storage, uh, how is the operation cost, and uh, whether it supports the support of VM. So right now, our solution, Cloud Shuffle Manager, is the only solution which satisfies the three dimensions. All other solutions never work in some part and fit some scenario. Yeah, every solution is good uh, in their certain scenario. Yeah. Here is the overall architecture of our solution. So in our side, we we build the whole platform uh, with a Spark Gateway. So that Spark Gateway is also an open source project. You can check the link and go there. It can help you to run Spark job very easily on the Kubernetes. And uh, we kind of enhance that to add uh, the Spark job, Spark Config Manager, so it can inject Cloud Shuffle Manager related configuration there, and the user don't need to do too much work. 
Then in the right side, it is how the Cloud Shop Manager is implemented. So the green blocks are the new components we add into Spark. The first one is we add a dual shuffle manager. When the executor is running, we copy the shuffle file from local disk to cloud storage. Yeah, it's just very simple copy. But it's very, it's very fast. And uh, we can also optimize the copy. And Hes will explain that later. So when the data is generated and another executor will read it with uh, continued execution. So what happens if the previous executor is dead? We add a fallback shuffle reader here. So if the previous executor is dead, the fallback shuffle reader will read from cloud storage and continue running. So this will make your application very reliable, and it will never fail. And sometime, when executor is dead, it may take a while for us to detect that, so it slows down the whole process. So we proactively add a dead executor detector. So if we detect an executor is dead, we will read from cloud storage directly without doing the fallback. So it can minimize the default recovery time. Cool, yeah. So my colleague will dive into some details and explain how we test it. OK, so I would like to uh, talk about uh, some of the details about our design. So firstly, uh, why we chose uh, cloud storage as the place to uh, store the software data. So because that brings us many benefits we really like. For example, high availability, high scalability, uh, building lifecycle manager so we can do data cleanup automatically, very easily. And uh, security features such as uh, fine grained access control, uh, encryption. So a lot of uh, building services uh, features available for us. And this is really a very easy and a lazy uh, approach for us. So we're trying to uh, take advantage all the existing services from the cloud so we don't have to reinvent the wheels so we can save our effort. And that's the main uh, reason we chose uh, cl uh, cloud storage. However, on the other side, the main challenge is that uh, cloud storage is relatively slow if we compare to local SSDs. Uh, and it is really a challenge because uh, that, uh, many of our effort has to address the, the problems. So uh, as I mentioned, that's the challenge. And uh, so we had to make uh, a number of uh, optimizations in order to achieve cost efficiency. And uh, here we list uh, a few of them. So firstly, uh, we, only, uh, we only read from cloud storage only if we have to, and meaning that the majority of the read still uh, going to the local disk. So the majority is still going to the fast uh, local disk only uh, fall back uh, if we have to. Uh, also, we added a feature called async write. So async write basically is saying that uh, we don't have to stop and wait until the copy finish. We can just uh, have the reducer side continue to uh, move on and then uh, let the uh, copy happen on the background asynchronously. So this can save us some runtime. And another feature that uh, we uh, is trying to leverage some caching mechanisms so to uh, catch small files. For example, the uh, index files, they are pretty small. So we're trying to uh, make some caching uh, on both executor side and the driver side, so we can uh, boost the, the performance. 
And uh, so with all this work, uh, we're able to do some evaluations for the performance that we're really concerned about. And in order to make a fair, uh, meaningful uh, evaluation, so uh, firstly, we do the uh, benchmarking evaluation using TCPDS. So TCPDS is an uh, industry uh, commonly used uh, benchmarking tool utility for uh, typical Spark workload uh, performance test. And this allows us to run a number of uh, uh, skills against the CSM to evaluate uh, how it works. And secondly, uh, we developed a utility called the uh, termination simulator. So basically, we like to simulate the, what happens in the real world. And then we run the benchmarking job uh, one uh, after another one. Uh, so basically, firstly, we run the baseline. And then we run uh, the job with the CSM enabled. Uh, we trigger the termination at the same time uh, in the same stage. So we're trying to apply the same condition to both so we can uh, compare the result uh, after. The key metrics uh, we care about uh, is basically twofold. So one is the overhead. So we want to make sure the overhead that we introduced is insignificant, is reasonable. And on the other side, we want to measure the runtime reduction. We like to see the runtime is reduced significantly so we can claim a profit a bit from that. So uh, this UI, uh, you may be familiar, since uh, uh, many people are familiar with Spark. So this is the Spark history UI. It shows what happens when uh, the termination happened. So we, uh, in this example, we uh, kill the four uh, executors uh, two at a time. And uh, you know that the sample data also lasts uh, when the termination happens, because uh, every executor, they have some, some uh, sample data inside it. And this shows uh, what happens uh, without CSM. So that's basically the baseline, uh, uh, native Spark, how native Spark behave when uh, termination happens. So on the bottom, you can see there is a fast failed exception. So that means the reducer side encountered this exception. They failed to fetch soft data from the mapper side because the mapper uh, had been killed. They, they were gone. So the uh, soft data was lost. As a result, on the left hand side, you can see there were multiple stage retries because Spark has to regenerate the soft data. And on the right hand side, you can see there are multiple entries in the input column. That's because the job, when they do retries, they had to reread the data from the source. So those, when those uh, retries happened, it take a lot of time, uh, and that's all dollars. And here is what happened when we enable CSM. So there was no stage retries, and uh, there are only the data only right once. So what happened behind the scene is that uh, uh, when we enable CSM, we got a copy, we got another copy of the sample data uh, on the cloud storage. So when the executor got killed, the reducer was able to fetch the other copy from the cloud storage, so it can continue to move on. So it doesn't, it didn't need to uh, redo the retry, and. Uh, the result is uh, showing uh, on the bottom. So we can see the runtime when we enable the CSM. It's about a 50% reduction compared to the baseline. And we run this uh, benchmarking multi multiple times. We use a scheduler so to schedule the job uh, regularly. And uh, on average, we observed uh, about uh, five to ten percent overhead. That's due to the actual write. So that's the one we concerned. And uh, with that, we were able to achieve reliability. So there are no uh, job failures uh, because we had another copy 
of the soft data on the cloud storage and that improved the reliability. And there are no much uh, stage retrace, also because uh, the job was able to continue without uh, uh, having to regenerate the soft data. And we also run this uh, on the standard jobs, so which are basically large scale uh, applications in production. And we observed a similar result. And we actually, uh, quite a few of our uh, standard jobs, we enabled rsync write. Uh, and uh, we observed a similar, uh, same runtime as the baseline. So meaning that the overhead is very minimum when we enable a single write. So basically we take a little risk, uh, but we gain some performance boost. Uh, and we do uh, notice there were about a 5% CPU usage uh, increase. And mostly uh, that's because uh, soft data we read from local disk, we need to do, we need to do uncompression and decryption and also copy itself, it takes CPUs. And uh, uh, also network I.O., there, so there is slightly overhead, uh, about 5%. And just a recap for the CSM. So CSM, it is a solution to uh, increase the reliability for Spark. Especially when Spark are running on top of a Kubernetes in a cloud environment. It is a serverless approach. I mean that we don't need to, it doesn't require to set up a separate shuffle service and then save a lot of effort. Uh, so we save cost both from the compute and from the SRE side. And we try to take advantage of cloud storage as a mature service. Uh, it is reliable, scalable, secure, secure, and there are a bunch of uh, uh, features we just want to take and uh, use. And uh, so this solution can be applied to multiple scenarios. So uh, firstly, it allows us to run Spark on top of Spark VMs. So Spark VMs basically coming with uh, a significant uh, cost uh, discount. So that enable uh, cost efficiency be available utilizing uh, Spark VMs. And another uh, use case is dynamic allocation. So I want to uh, talk a little bit uh, about dynamic allocation. Uh, so currently, uh, Spark, uh, if we run Spark on Kubernetes, a require to, if we want to enable dynamic allocation, a require to enable shuffle tracking. And the shuffle tracking timeout by default is infinity. So basically it says, it means that uh, uh, if there is any shuffle data on the executors, dyna dynamic allocation will not work very effectively. Uh, but if we enable CSM, since we have another copy of soft data on the cloud storage, we achieved somehow uh, decoupling for compute and storage. So when we enable it in our uh, standard jobs, we observed uh, uh, the, dynamic, the dynamic, dynamic allocation uh, happened more effectively, more efficiently. And that basically it is uh, horizontal out of scale for Spark uh, on the job level. Yeah, that, and that's uh, pretty much it for today's talk. And uh, we like to take uh, questions or uh, feedbacks if there is. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, if you have any question related to this, or you have any question about Spark dynamic allocation, yeah, we can feel free to ask. Yeah. Oh, oh the question is, is it open sourced? Uh, it is not open sourced yet, so we are working on it. <laughs> but the idea is general, and uh, overall, it doesn't take too much effort to implement it yourself, yeah, by the way.
。OK， go ahead。Uh, sorry, I cannot hear. So there's a microphone there, yeah. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the data format that you are using when you're writing to the cloud storage? Okay. This is something prefer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can answer this. So the question is, the data format. Yeah. We. The short answer is we didn't change the data format because we want the solution to be simple. And uh, the long answer is a Spark Shuffle file. It is kind of a file with segmented. Uh, it has several segments. Each segment is a split. It's corresponding to the process split in the Spark. We just copied the whole file to the cloud storage. So we're not trying to do any uh, shorting merging uh, those stuff things yet. Uh, but uh, it's a good uh, question that uh, may potentially improve the for, uh, performance further, yeah. <coughs> I may have one. Um, you mentioned that storing this uh, shuffle data on uh, the cloud blob store is secure. Um, how do you achieve that? Oh, you mean security? Yes. Like authentication, and none other user can read the very same bucket or the same data. Yeah, good question. So as I mentioned, that uh, we uh, we trying to fully uh, leverage the features from the cloud storage, and uh, the cloud storage it come with uh, fine grained access control, and uh, we uh, so uh, so we basically use the. Uh, uh, the security uh, access control to control the access. For example, we use the uh, IAM rows, so that uh, enable uh, to uh, have authentication and authorization happened on the sample data. And uh, uh, we uh, we do have like uh, queue based authorization, also, and uh, so we can uh, uh, keep uh, the sample data. Uh, in a secure way on a cloud storage. Yeah, so, yeah, that explained uh, from the cloud storage part. From Spark side, uh, there's a setting. You can enable data encryption in Spark. So it's a Spark config supported by native Spark, and we also leverage that. After you enable the encryption, Spark will generate a unique key for each application, and it will use that key to encrypt your data before it writes to the local disk and write to the cloud storage. And because other applications and other people do not know that key, so the data is, is very secure only for your own application. Yeah. All right, yeah. so another question. So from what I'm understanding, the lack of an external shuffle service makes so that if you're trying to use the dynamic executor allocation, uh, basically it's gonna, how to say, have a harder time in downscaling these uh, executors uh, because, uh, I mean, those partitions are gonna maybe still needed in the future, uh, in the future stages. Yeah. Uh, is your solution, uh, as how to say, uh, allowing Spark to downscale those uh, uh, dynamic uh, allocated executors? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, as you mentioned, without uh, uh, another copy of the soft data, all the soft data will be stored on the local disk. And that's associated with the executors. So even though you enable dynamic allocation, but uh, the soft tracking will disallow the scaling down happen effectively. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So, I, so we, yeah, just want to explain, with Shuffle, our Cloud Shuffle Manager, you can enable that and downscale very easily. Without Cloud Shuffle Manager, normally it doesn't work well with native Spark. There's a risk in, uh, involved because you don't set infinity as the tracking, and so if, uh, if they get uh, um, deleted, uh, the executor, then you lost the data and you start again. That's yeah, exactly. We, we use Cloud Shuffle Manager, we set that timeout to zero. So it so just expires immediately. It can just be uh, 
shut down at yes. any time because you can get from the cloud storage. Yes, exactly. So, Cloud storage, we are uh, talking about uh, S3, GCS, and that kind yes. of stuff. Yes. Yeah, we're trying to uh, make uh, the solution uh, cloud uh, provider agnostic. So it means that uh, it can be used uh, across different uh, service provi providers. Yeah. Uh, one curiosity is how long did uh, it take for you to build that? Uh, because you said it's not open source yet, uh, you can build it yourself. The idea is quite easy. But I'm, I'm curious how long uh, did it take? Good, good, good. Yeah, good question. <laughs> Thanks for asking that. To get there is not that easy because you see, there are so many solutions previously. We tried different ideas and we do multiple iterations to get there. So now the idea is very simple, but it is after several rounds of iteration. If you just focus on the current idea, the change is only on the shuffle writer and the reader. It's a small change. And uh, you add some retry in, in Spark internal code. I would say if you are very familiar with Spark, you can do the change adding some testing time, maybe in one or two months, if you are familiar with Spark. Yeah. Okay. And uh, did you need also to patch uh, Spark core? Or was it possible to do it uh, just using uh, uh, plugins, let's say? Yeah, both are possible. If you want to do it quick and dirty, you can just make a change in, inside the Spark kernel core code. But Spark Shuffle Manager has an abstraction like Shuffle Manager interface. Mm -hmm. So previously, I built my previous version of Shuffle service. I used that without need to change the Spark core code. But that will take kind of more time, but both are possible, yeah. Okay, but in your case, so you are, uh, because I'm curious about the, um, let's say, the fallback logic. Is that uh, built into your shuffle manager? Uh, so uh, you don't need to touch anything of Spark core to make that work? Because your shuffle manager is like uh, probably borrowing some code from the standard one plus adding your logic. Is that the, the case? Uh, right. Right now, we embed that code in Spark core part because we want to iterate fast. Okay. So we are working on to extract that and uh, put it in the Shuffle Manager abstraction sure. so it won't kind of change the internal okay, code. Got, yeah. got it. So right now you have uh, like your Spark distro. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Cool. No problem. Yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. Bo and me will be around. If you have questions, uh, feedbacks, welcome to Resource. Thank you. Okay, thank you.